A career that spanned 50 years and more, upwards of 150 million records sold, over 50 motion pictures made. That, in a nutshell, was the supreme resume of the most popular showman of the 20th century. Prior to his passing in 1998, Frank Sinatra lived his golden age in the decades following the Second World War. His rise mirrored that of an America which, during the 50s and 60s, reinvented itself and imposed a new aesthetic on the world. Sinatra was more than a voice. He was an icon. His life and his style embodied cool, and his catalogue of timeless songs will always be the soundtrack to the American dream, for which he remains a shining example. recording, take three. If you're a fantasy, then I'm content to be in love with lovely you and pray my dream comes true. I long to kiss you. But I would not dare I'm so afraid That you may vanish in the air So darling If our romance should break up I hope I never Frank was born December 12, 1915, in Hoboken, New Jersey. Facing New York City across the Hudson River, the city was home to large immigrant communities. Frank was an Italian-American, disdainfully referred to by some as a Dago. He was a kid with a frail physique, his face marked on the left-hand side by the souvenir of a difficult delivery, which earned him the nickname Scarface. An only child from a humble background, he was a shy, lonely kid. He would spend hours in front of his radio, listening to the songs of crooners. On occasion, he would even sing some of them for the customers of the bar his parents ran for a time during Prohibition. The year he turned 17, he was banished from the family home by his father, who thought it was time he stood on his own feet. In 1939, the young singer in search of a contract married Nancy Barbato, a neighbor with whom he had been going steady for almost five years. A page of history was turning, and the skinny guinea from Hoboken would soon become a musical phenomenon such as America had never seen.
Back then, the New York jazz scene was buzzing. People flocked to the clubs to dance to big bands, and the all-powerful radio stations would relay the new sounds to the four corners of the land. Frank would take part in amateur contests, singing in social clubs and roadhouses, often for peanuts. Haunted by a fierce determination to succeed, he was convinced that music was the only thing that rang his bell and could enable him to one day become somebody. His first real professional experience came in 1935 as one of the Hoboken Four, an Italian-American quartet with whom he sang for a year. By 1939, he had moved up a league. Saturday night is the loneliest night of the week. Noticed by trumpeter Harry James, he joined his orchestra and set off on tour, also taking in his first experiences in the studio. Until I hear you at the door, until you're in my arms once more. Saturday night is the loneliest night of the week. Some months later, in early 1940, he joined the orchestra of trombonist Tommy Dorsey, one of the most popular of the period, and quickly became its star vocalist. In these months spent on the roads of North America alongside other musicians, Frank learned stagecraft, rhythm, and honed his singing voice. Observing Dorsey at great length, he drew inspiration from his technique to better control his own breathing and thus to modulate his vocal phrasing. In September 1942, age 26, he finally felt ready. Triggering his mentor's wrath, he decided to leave him and strike out on his own. You'll never know just how much I It was on Broadway, in the Paramount Theatre, that Frank Sinatra, alone on stage, hit the headlines. From his very first appearance in December, each of his concerts gave rise to collective hysteria. Thousands of teenagers jostled for a chance to applaud their new idol. Cause haven't I told you so a million or more times you went away and my heart The mere sound of his voice could send schoolgirls into a trance, into a frenzy, into a dead faint. This was referred to as the Sinatra swoon. I speak your name in my every if there is some other In just a few months, his life had changed dramatically. He had become the voice, the romantic star who spoke to the heartland of an America scarred by the years of the war. A first-rate crooner who could strike up an intimate relationship with his audience, something never seen before. Sinatra sings like Clark Gable makes love, went the refrain. He signed with the Columbia label, and his first singles were broadcast in constant rotation on the airwaves while he himself had his own radio show, the Frank Sinatra program. This newfound fame naturally guided his steps to the studios of Hollywood, whose musicals were increasingly popular with the cinema going public. Swapping the New York City skyline for the luxury hotels of LA, Frank made a handful of pictures for RKO before signing a five-year contract with the prestigious MGM. 
There, his talent was often teamed with that of Gene Kelly, future star of Singing in the Rain, who became both his co-star and his dance teacher. The two men were complementary and made a tremendously popular team. She begged me. True, true, true. She The final Sinatra and Kelly screen collaboration, On the Town, was also the first musical to be filmed on location. The filming drew thousands of onlookers. In the Italian quarter, where Frank was an acknowledged star, the police were even forced to intervene to contain the eager crowd of his fans. By now, the war had ended for the USA. Considered unfit for service for medical reasons by his draft board, Frank did not take part in the fighting and was, for this reason, the target of much criticism. However, as an artist, he had gotten squarely behind the war effort, recording and performing for the troops with other stars of stage, screen and song. He was often to be seen in the company of Orson Welles, Judy Garland, or even crooner Bing Crosby, once his idol, become his rival as well as his friend. Frank had also been noticed in a short propaganda film where he played himself, denouncing to young boys anti-Semitism and all forms of intolerance. Look, fellas, religion makes no difference, except maybe to a Nazi or somebody as stupid. Why, people all over the world worship God in many different ways. God created everybody. He didn't create one people better than another. Your blood's the same as mine. Mine's the same as his. Well, how to go to work? What do you work? I sing. Ah, oh, you're a kid. Come here. Now you all stand here, and no hissing aloud. What is America to me? A name. A map or a flag I see, a certain word, democracy. What is America to me? Yet over the years, the ideal image of a Frank Sinatra brandishing the banner of the American dream, a model of social integration, developed cracks. His proclamations in favor of the Democratic Party, particularly during the 1944 presidential elections, earned him the wrath of the conservative press, which didn't hesitate to accuse him of communist sympathies, and thereafter watched him closely for the slightest misstep. His relations with the underworld, which then managed from behind the scenes a major slice of the showbiz industry, were closely monitored. During a trip to Cuba in 1947, he was spotted in the company of multiple mafia godfathers, gathered as guests of Lucky Luciano. A journalist, Lee Mortimer, accused him of having close ties with organized crime and of carrying drug money. He even contacted the FBI, demanding that an official investigation be opened. Frank denied everything. Though no evidence of his guilt could be established, the incident left its mark on people's minds. And when, several weeks later, he hit Mortimer in the face in a Hollywood club, he also showed that he could turn into a nefarious bad boy with an impulsive, violent temper.
By now ensconced on the west coast, the Sinatra family had grown. Nancy Jr. had been born in 1940. Frank Jr., four years later. Tina, the last, had come in 1948. Though his many activities were a drain on his time, Frank always tried to spare time for his children, whom he adored. But he also gave in to the excesses of the Hollywood lifestyle and stepped up his extramarital relationships with young starlets like Marilyn Maxwell and Lana Turner. By February 1950, Nancy had reached breaking point and announced their separation in a press release. At the time, Frank was involved in a passionate relationship with Ava Gardner, a sculptural beauty he had met on the MGM lot. She soon became one of the great loves of his life. It took Frank, still officially married to Nancy, more than a year to obtain a divorce. He finally married Ava on November 7, 1951. Several months later, at the premiere of his new film, she appeared on his arm as the new Mrs. Sinatra. Beautiful and talented, the couple turned every head. Even Frank's parents were won over. Seemingly idyllic, the union of these two strong personalities turned out to be destructive. Fueled by jealousy and alcohol, there were frequent and violent disputes. These night owls were probably a little too much alike, excessive, quick-tempered, unfaithful too. The path taken by their careers also became a source of imbalance. In the space of just a few movies, Ava had become one of Hollywood's great stars and her fame at that point outshone that of her husband. As their clashes became more frequent and more unpleasant, Ava finally decided to break up in October 1953. This coincided with Frank's period in the wilderness. Following some poor artistic choices, his career as a singer had stalled. Yesterday an idol, he had become a has-been, dropped by his agent and his record label. MGM2 ended his contract prematurely. They said he was finished. Yet he survived and pulled off one of the most spectacular comebacks in history. Hello, tough monkey. Frank owed his return to center stage to the character of Angelo Maggio in the motion picture From Here to Eternity. It was a role he wanted at any price and he fought for months to obtain it. Ava's word in the ear of the president of Colombia's wife probably helped. There was even talk of the mafia bringing pressure to bear. Frank totally identified with Angelo, an Italian-American kid from Brooklyn, bullied in a disciplinary camp in Hawaii. It was only a supporting role, but he knew it was one in which he'd finally be able to show his full potential. What you doing in uniform? I think he would join in the army. <laughs> or maybe I'll go to Mexico and become a cowboy. You want to go with me? You keep on drinking, you'll be as much use as a melted candle. You're absolutely right. Bart Senator, there, whiskey. Large whiskey. Excuse me. Hey, buddy. Sam. Hey, coming out, fellas. The Terry Gimmel's basement. Stand back there now. Here we go. Seven for daddy. Five deuce. E seven. Snake eyes. <laughs> That's the story of my life. The movie was a huge hit with critics and cinema goers alike. It won eight Oscars, including that of Best Supporting Actor, awarded to Frank. It was a moment he chose to savor in the company of Frank and Nancy Jr., whom he picked up from their mothers. 
The whole industry applauded his performance and paid him a sustained tribute. Frank was back. Frank was back, but it was a different Frank, mellowed by his ordeals. Hi, Frankie. Hello. By this time, Frank was 40. His loves, his scars, his fatherhood, his journey through the wilderness. Now his characters were feeding on everything that he'd been through. Like Frankie Machine, the junkie musician from The Man with the Golden Arm, who fights to kick heroin and rebuild his life. This remained his favorite role. <laughs> and this time, Frank played the lead. A sign of true recognition, director Otto Preminger preferred him to Marlon Brando, early frontrunner for the part. Two, three, four. Mr. Machine, the first four bars is all you. Come on, let's try it again. One, two, three, four. I'm sorry. Are you all set? Once again. One, two, three, four. Through his modern, sincere, economical acting, Frank managed to imbue his character with a real sense of truth. In The Man with the Golden Arm, Sinatra the actor asserted his style and the performance merited another Oscar nomination. From Vincenti Minnelli to Frank Capra, he had now won over the most prestigious directors. And over the next decade, he would work with all the studios, tackling every genre. Yes, Frank was back, and he was a force to be reckoned with. His musical career also received a shot in the arm. Those fingers in my head that sly come hither stare That strips my conscience bare It's witchcraft In 1953, Frank signed with Capitol Records, downtown Hollywood's famous record label. Teamed with a new arranger, Nelson Riddle, he recorded in just a few years a series of albums that soon were branded classics of American 20th century popular song. Cause it's witchcraft, wicked witchcraft. Frank was no longer the cute crooner of the 40s singing sweet melodies for the adolescents. His voice had gained maturity, and his musical palette had diversified, cheerfully alternating swing with melancholy. My heart says yes indeed in me. Proceed with what you're leading me to. In the studio, he was a driven perfectionist. It's such he only recorded at night, as close to the band as possible to better feel the energy. A few close friends were always present. They were his tryout audience. He appeared on stage all over the United States and Europe. But more often than not, you'd find him in Las Vegas, the gaming and entertainment capital of the world, where each casino hotel has its own theater. The city had become a must for US artists. And although I know it's strictly taboo, 
Frank gave his first Vegas show in 1951 and from then on returned regularly. He became the undisputed king of the city, where the mere announcement of his presence would fill all the hotels. When Sinatra is in Las Vegas, remarked director Billy Wilder, there's a certain electricity permeating the air. At the Sands, where he became a shareholder, he played to full houses, extending a personal welcome to the big names of show business and politics. In the 50s, the town took off. It became at once a vast pleasure dome and the capital of organized crime. A gigantic theme park where reality was subsumed by a dream world built of rhinestones and glamour. The names of the casinos on the Strip, the famous Central Avenue of Las Vegas, became world famous. The Flamingo the Riviera, the stardust biggest of all, or the dunes and its atmosphere that evoked the Arabian Nights. For its opening on May 23, 1955, who else did the management handpick to be its good genie but Vegas's biggest star? On the banks of Lake Tahoe, northeast of Sacramento, Frank bought his own hotel casino. The Calneva Resort is ideally located in dream scenery plumb on the border between California and Nevada. Frank spent large sums of money on his renovation, looking to create an establishment of great prestige. Lake Tahoe was, at the time, one of the favored destinations of socialites and screen celebrities who came here to find some peace far from the public eye. Perched above the shore, Calneva's cabins offered a refuge that was both rustic and luxurious set against a natural backdrop, the exact opposite of Vegas. Frank also had a concert hall built, an intimate place with a cozy atmosphere and just a few dozen seats. Here, he would regularly welcome his friends, Peggy Lee, Judy Garland, Elizabeth Taylor, all came to applaud the voice at home, alongside a few very privileged customers. In the 1950s, Frank was successful in everything. He was a recognized artist and a shrewd businessman, whose name, face, and voice were known to all and who spoke directly to his audience in many of the trailers for his movies. Hello yourself, and greetings from your pal Joey. That's me. Of course, my name's Frank Sinatra. But in my latest picture, I play pal Joey. Oh, I'm your pal Joey. Now, before you see this unusual picture, I think there are a few things you should know about Joey. First of all, he lives in a world all his own. Joey even has his own slanguage made up purely of Joeyisms. Now, to start with, we'll take the word mouse. This is a mouse, a beautiful mouse called Kim Novak. Each day is Valentine's Day. And now that we've gotten this far, I suppose you think that the plural of mouse is mouses. It is mice, and here are some dandy examples. Now, 
studying a case history of Joey, you must know his philosophy. You treat a dame like a lady, and treat a lady like a dame. She gets too hungry for dinner at eight. She likes the theater, never comes late. She'd never bother with people she'd hate. That's why the lady is a tramp. On screen, the most sophisticated beauties would fall into Frank's arms. Be they brunette, blonde, or redhead, none could resist his nonchalant charm. Including the future princess of Monaco, Grace Kelly, for whom he challenged Bing Crosby in the musical High Society. Hey, Bing, huh? don't you and Frank uh, kick any tunes around together? Oh, indeed we do. We barber up a couple of beauties. Give me an A there. I'll show you. Give me some help. Oh, you play beautifully. I drink to your health. Ah, let's drink to your wealth. You're my bon ami. Hey, that's French. A liberty fraternity. fraternity. Have you heard it's in the stars? Next July we collide with Mars. Well, did you ever? What a swell party. Swell party. Swell again, elegant. Away from the movie sets, the list of his conquests was no less impressive. Flings were reported with most of his co-stars, Kim Novak, Natalie Wood, Deborah Carr. Marilyn, the most desirable woman in the world, was also one of his mistresses. Right up to Lauren Bacall, who with Bogart formed one of Hollywood's star couples. When Bogart passed on, Lauren learned to live again with the help of longtime friend Frank. This time the relationship was more serious and he even proposed marriage. But when he found out that she'd been talking to the press about their relationship, he ended it summarily. Frank didn't like not being in control of situations and he could bear a grudge. With Frank, it's also about friendship. Like the Rat Pack, a self-chosen name for a select band of buddies who were never far away, a sort of Praetorian guard of loyal accomplices. Frank became their natural leader. They were all artists, actors, singers, and of course, lady killers. Dean Martin, the other Italian-American crooner. As well as Sammy Davis Jr., the gifted showman with extraordinary energy encountered on the club circuit in the 1940s. In an America where racial segregation was still a reality, Frank and Sammy's friendship shocked a fair few. Frank couldn't care less. He was right behind the civil rights movement that was shaking up the country and frequently took part in galas supporting Martin Luther King. How could it be otherwise? As a musician, as well as a friend, he had always worked with the greatest names in jazz. Nat King Cole, Billie Holiday, Louis Armstrong, Count Basie. The announcement of Sammy's wedding to Swedish actress May Britt sparked a wave of indignation in the conservative press.
Despite threats, Frank publicly supported them and agreed to be their witness. The members of the Rat Pack were linked by a pact of friendship. In 1960, Frank sealed that pact on the silver screen. Ocean's Eleven brought together all the talents of the Rat Pack on the same bill. They all played World War II veterans who meet to carry out simultaneous heists in five major casinos. Sam, how are you? Oh, same as always. I move, I breathe, I seem to feel the thrill of life along the keel. You sound like a ferry boat. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a ferry boat, I'm a very manly sloop. Wherever I go, people stare at me in dumb admiration. And yeah, what happens when they speak? The movie was, of course, shot on location in Vegas, and every evening once the shooting had stopped, the Rat Pack hid the stage in the sands, glass in hand, to liven up the place. The success of Ocean's Eleven encouraged Frank to reunite the Rat Pack for several other movies. None were masterpieces, just mass-market entertainment vehicles to highlight each of the members of the group, especially its leader. I swear the book's on Big Jim, but I don't hear nobody saying thanks. Thanks. That's all you got to say, huh? All yeah. right, I'm gonna give it to you straight. Robbo, listen to me, you're out of line. Now get back in line. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to have you hit. If you have to have me hit, you have to have me hit. Cause no one I know gets so such a glow out of bang, bang, like me. Will you stop clowning around and get up here? Though the Rat Pack movies were not brimming with cinematic ambition, at least Frank and his friends seemed to have a good time shooting them. On the release of Sergeants 3, the Time magazine reviewer summed it up succinctly. Sinatra and his Cub Scout troop are pioneering in a new art form, the $4 million home movie. In Vegas or in Palm Springs, luxury oasis at the heart of the Californian desert, the Rat Pack set the tone for La Dolce Vita, American style. They fed the dreams of a whole nation that cherished its idols and for whom they were a model of success. Frank was at the peak of his glory and his ambitions seemed to know no bounds. At this time, he was fascinated by the personality of John Kennedy, the young Massachusetts senator and presidential candidate, and could sense he was going places. The two men became friends, sharing the same democratic ideas as well as the same taste for Hollywood beauties. Frank threw himself into supporting Kennedy. He mobilized the entertainment industry and organized a good many support galas. He even lent his voice to the campaign hymn. One of the members of the Rat Pack, Peter Lawford, played a starring role in this episode. Married to Patricia Kennedy, one of John's sisters, he had become the senator's brother-in-law. With plenty of opportunism, Frank didn't hesitate to get back in touch with him years after the two men had fallen out. On November the 8th, 1960, Kennedy won the election and officially became the 35th president of the United States of America. As a reward for his commitment, Frank was asked to organize the inaugural gala, for which he summoned to the stage all the Hollywood elite. As a supreme honor, it was also he who escorted the first lady to the presidential box. Yet it was the last time that Frank met the president. Moreover, he never set foot in the White House during his term of office. For many members of the Kennedy clan, Frank's image was far too nefarious, and it was vital that he be kept at arm's length. 
Joe, the president's father, was probably the one most opposed to their friendship. But there was also Jackie, his wife, and his brother, Bobby. Frank was paying for having served as intermediary between the Kennedy family and the Chicago Mafia during the primaries. The secret intervention of gangster Sam Giancana played a decisive role in carrying the state of West Virginia. At the time, the words fraud and corruption were evoked publicly, a memory that some would rather erase. Bobby, appointed Attorney General, embarked on a great crusade against organized crime, one which did not spare yesterday's allies. But for Frank, the height of humiliation was yet to come. In the spring of 1962, John Kennedy scheduled a tour in the west of the country and proposed to stay with Frank at his Palm Springs home. Bobby objected, and yielding to his brother's insistence, Kennedy canceled at the last minute, preferring to stay with Bing Crosby, although Crosby was notoriously Republican. The incident triggered Frank's fury. He saw Peter Lawford, dispatched by the Kennedys to pass on the bad news, as guilty of not having stood up for him. He banned him for life from his circle of friends. In the early 1960s, television had invaded every home. Frank naturally had his own show, but his audience had changed. No longer was adolescent America swooning for him. The rock revolution was underway, and Elvis was the hero of the new generation. March 3rd, 1960 saw him return from military service after an absence of 18 months. A great fan of the King, Nancy Sinatra Jr. went to greet him. She also took him a welcome gift from Frank. It was a strong symbol, one that matched the event. That day, the press learned of the coming reunion of the two giants of American popular song. Elvis was Frank's star guest for a planned TV special to be aired on the ABC network. Oh, what I tell we do, we do a, we do a, uh, uh, you do witchcraft, okay? And I'll do one of the other ones. Okay, Mr. Nelson? We work in the same way, only in different areas. Love me tender, love me sweet, never let me go. You have made my life complete, and I love you so. Those fingers in my hair, I come hither the stair, that strips my conscience bare, it's foolish Love me tender, love me true, all my dreams fulfilled For oh, my darling, I love you And I always will It's such an ancient pitch What a switch Oh, there's no nicer witch than witch I love you And I always will The friendly duet by the two record industry rivals would remain a classic moment. For Elvis's manager, keen to polish the image of his charge, the operation was a success. And above all, Frank, by anointing Elvis as his successor, showed the public that he remained king. At 1.25, the motorcade moves into the downtown area. 
Death is six minutes away. In a warehouse, a sniper with a rifle poised waits. The cheers of the crowd almost muffle the three shots. The assassin's aim is deadly. The area is a swarm with police, rangers, and secret service men. The murderer slips the net, but a few blocks away, a man is captured after he is reported to have killed a policeman. Meanwhile, the president had been rushed to a nearby hospital where life lingered as a waiting world prayed. A half hour later, he was dead. On November 22, 1963, the assassination of Kennedy in Dallas struck at the heart of America. Despite the estrangement of recent years, Frank was grief-stricken and interrupted his shooting to be alone for three days, away from prying eyes. Barely two weeks later, he was involved in another drama, this time even closer to home. His son, Frank Jr., who had begun a career as a singer, was kidnapped while giving a concert in Lake Tahoe Casino. This triggered a vast FBI investigation. After his father had paid a ransom of $240,000, Frank Jr. was released unharmed and the kidnappers finally arrested. Frank was nearly 50. Despite his success, he knew very well the new era that was dawning was not quite his. Every day put a little more distance between himself and the post-Kennedy American youth, who were into flower power and demonstrating against the Vietnam War. These fights were not his fights. So what else could he do apart from have fun? Well, shall I scream rape now or wait and phone in a complaint? If you're asking me, I'd rather you press charges. By the end of the 60s, Frank was shooting fewer movies. Riding the wave of fashion, he had some success appearing in police thrillers. He twice took on the role of blasé, macho, loner detective Tony Rome, a role that fit him like a glove. The action so fast. It's a wonder Tony Rome stays alive. Look out, look out! single. Frank Sinatra is Tony Rome. Ring-a-ding-ding-ding. -ding -ding. This period was also marked by the failure of his third marriage. His bride was actress Mia Farrow, a slim, fragile young flower of the 60s. Frank fell head over heels for her, though it was hard to imagine two people less alike. The woman he called Babyface was 30 years his junior. She was also a Buddhist who hung out with the Beatles and smoked marijuana. Irreconcilable gaps quickly appeared between their worlds. Breaking point was reached in 1967 when Roman Polanski, talented new cinema director, offered Mia the leading role in Rosemary's Baby alongside John Cassavetes. Frank, who wanted her by his side in Tony Rome, urged her to refuse. Mia stood firm, and the sentence was handed down. While on location in New York, she received the visit of Frank's lawyer, who served the divorce papers. Their marriage had lasted just two years. Musically speaking, Frank eased through the late 60s with several global hits recorded for his label, Reprise Records. Strangers in the Night, Something Stupid with Daughter Nancy, my way. But his albums, like his movies, were no longer major events. The time had now come for the countless compilations, fond farewells, and comebacks, as well as much publicized duets with the talents of the moment. The voice earned a new nickname, Old Blue Eyes. But on stage, the audience still showered its warmth on him, with more and more jostling for admission to his concerts. When he passed on in 1998, Frank was already a legend. 
The story of this kid from Hoboken, golden-voiced crooner and turbulent leader of the Rat Pack, had over time become the story of America. A nostalgic America, which, through him, could tirelessly relive the heyday that had now disappeared. Go up. 